Hey everybody, how you doing today? This is Mike Webb. If you've always thought about buying an airplane, but you were concerned about how you were supposed to cover all of the costs yourself, and maybe you don't want to have a partner in that airplane, stick with me today. I'll tell you about how you can finally afford that plane you've always wanted. This is kind of badass, huh? Works well, that is. The topic of this video is an aviation leaseback on an aircraft. Is it a good idea? Is it something you should explore? How has it worked out for me, etc. So the bottom line is this all started out when I was a student pilot. I had gotten my private pilot's license and was working on my instrument rating. And it occurred to me, as it does to almost all pilots at some point in their training careers or after they've gotten their licenses, I'm spending a lot of money renting these planes. It would make more sense financially to own my own plane and fly that instead of renting a plane from the FBO. So I started looking into aviation leasebacks. I'd seen an article about the idea that buying an airplane and then putting it on a leaseback with a flight school or an FBO could be a good way to curb those costs. Now for those of you who aren't familiar with what a leaseback agreement is, it's where you as the owner decide to have your aircraft on a rental line or in a club potentially, someplace where you're not the only person who can fly the airplane. And in return, when they rent that aircraft, you as the owner get a certain percentage of the rental rate. Now, depending on the arrangement you have with the FBO or the flight school, that commission or percentage could be different. It really all depends on the arrangement you have with your particular FBO. So I started looking into this thinking, is this something that would work for me? And the bottom line is there aren't very many answers online. There certainly aren't very many videos on YouTube that I could find talking about anybody's experience with this. What I did find was a lot of people saying it's a horrible idea. Between the forums on the internet, chat room, the overwhelming response was that it's a horrible idea for an owner and the only people who it ever works out for are the FBO or the flight school. Well, I can tell you that I wasn't particularly encouraged by that response, but I kept looking into it for myself and I decided that maybe that those people's experiences were not necessarily the same experience I was going to have. There's also talk about the fact that your airplane will get destroyed by all the other renters and that if it's your baby, that do you really want to put your airplane into that sort of environment where it's going to get treated poorly by all the renters and the students, hard landings, etc. But again, here's why I'm doing this video. There were no answers out there that I could find. Uh, nobody had anything positive to say about the leaseback experience. This is why I'm doing this video. I've had enough experience now that I feel comfortable uh, talking about my experience. I've also had several people reach out to me who have met me through my pilot training. They'd heard through the grapevine that I was doing this through my FBO and flight school, and they wanted to know how they could potentially go down this road too. So that's why I'm doing this video today. So I've had enough experience now, I believe, where I can try to tell you exactly today what I think you should be considering if you're looking at a potential leaseback of an aircraft you own. So there are a bunch of things to consider here, okay? First and foremost, and most likely, not most likely, definitely the most important thing in this entire situation is you have to have the right plane for the right school. Has to be a good fit. The right plane with the right school, success. The wrong plane with the wrong school, not a success. I think your best chance for success with the leaseback is to find a flight school or an FBO in a busy metropolitan area that has a lot of training activity and a lot of renters. If you live in a rural area and you're thinking about buying an airplane and putting it into the FBO where there's maybe four or five pilots in the local area who do all the flying and the flying they do is very sporadic and just the occasional $100 hamburger, leaseback is not going to be a good solution for you. Find a plane that fills a crucial need at an FBO or a flight school. For instance, if your FBO or flight school has a lot of pilots that are hoping to get a, their hands on an airplane where they can earn their high performance endorsement, you bringing one on board could be a great way to meet a need but also make good money. Another good aircraft to bring on board is if you own a complex aircraft, flight school or FBO that you're looking to work with doesn't have one, that would be a great idea to make some money. Pilots are always looking to add endorsements to their portfolio and a complex endorsement is a really important one to get. A complex airplane is defined as having retractable landing gear, a constant speed prop, and movable or adjustable flaps. And finally, another opportunity to explore would be if you brought a technologically advanced aircraft or TAA on board to a flight school. A technologically advanced aircraft is designed as one having an electronic primary flight display or PFD, multifunction display or MFD, IFR capable GPS with a moving map, and a two-axis autopilot. 
Another good way that you can provide value uh, to an FBO or a flight school, and it'll increase your chance of success as a leaseback owner, is to take a look at the existing fleet of aircraft that are available and find out where you might be able to bolster and support the existing aircraft that are busy or find an entirely new avenue for renters and pilots to explore. So an example of that would be if you're at a flight school where they have a couple 172s and those 172s are flying all the time, then perhaps providing another 172 will help those people have more choices when inevitably the aircraft that are there are down for maintenance. So if you're at a flight school where there's a bunch of students and they've chosen to train on one platform like the 172 or the PA-28 series or perhaps the Diamond series, DA-20s, etc. If you look at their existing fleet and you find that they have three DA-20s and they all fly a lot, well maybe adding a fourth DA-20 is not the best idea, but they have one PA-28, that one flies a lot. But when that one goes down for maintenance, what are the pilots supposed to do? Well, again, adding another PA-28 in that scenario might be a great chance for success because you've now added some backup redundancy to those people that are choosing to fly a PA-28. Here's one more way to look at it. People generally like to choose a platform with which to train or fly, and they want to stick with it. Adding more planes options into a certain style or type that is already doing well at the flight school might be a pretty good way to go. After all, pilots do like to train in consistent types of aircraft, and we all have our favorites, and when we find them, we like to generally stick to them. Okay, so here's another pretty important thing to consider when you're looking at a leaseback opportunity, is the maintenance that's being done at these clubs or FBOs or flight school, is the maintenance being done in-house or do they shop that out? In other words, if your aircraft is part of this FBO or flight school, when it needs to get its 50 hour or its 100 hour or annual inspection, do they have folks in-house that can take care of that? And usually that means at a faster rate or do they need to find solutions outside of their own place? If they do have an in-house maintenance department and it's well run, that can save a lot of time and energy when these things inevitably will come up. It's not a deal breaker if they don't have their own in-house maintenance. Maybe you have your own personal mechanic or somebody you know that you trust and has done a great job for you. If that's the case, there's nothing wrong with that. But just keep in mind that when maintenance items do come up, Speed and turnaround time is of the essence. And I mean quickly, your nemesis as a leaseback owner is downtime. Aircraft on the ground, not a good thing for anybody involved. You don't make money, the FBO doesn't make money, no one makes money as long as your aircraft is sitting on the ground not flying. And another thing is, as a pilot myself, if I like an aircraft but it looks like it seems to always be down or when it is down it takes forever to come back up, I'm going to lose faith that that aircraft is going to be available on an acceptable manner for me to continue to fly with it. If you take too long on these issues, they may just choose another plane to fly with in general. Okay, so I mentioned before that it's been good for me, so let's talk about how it's actually working out for me. So I bought a PA-28 and added it to a flight school that I was already training at. It was a little slow at first, but eventually it picked up. And a lot of that has to do with circumstances that were out of my control, as they will be in any situation. But I did take a few steps to proactively increase my chances of success. Specifically, I wanted to make my plane as attractive as possible to students and renters alike. And a great way to do that is I did some avionics upgrades. So avionics upgrades aren't inexpensive by any means, but I made some very specific choices that I wanted to see from myself and my own airplane because after all, I do own it. But I also made a big effort to make sure that the avionics upgrades that I did would not just benefit me as the owner, but would make it more attractive to anybody who wanted to fly my plane. And I can confirm that those changes that I made really did lead to a lot more interest in my airplane. Everybody who's flown it says they were great choices. Now I'm probably going to make an entire separate video about those avionics upgrades that I did to my plane because certainly I was looking for information before I made it. And if I had found a lot of videos that had the specific components I was looking to upgrade in, that would have been wonderful. So here we are now. The avionics upgrades were made. The plane became a lot more popular. It's flown a lot more. And how am I doing now? Well, in a short word, awesome. 2019 was a great year for me. The plane flew a lot more than I expected. And what that means is that I'm getting the hours I need as a pilot by flying my own plane when I want to, but it's also making revenue for me when I'm not flying the plane. When I do choose to fly my plane, I don't have to pay the same rate as everyone else. I can if I want, or I can choose to log them as owner hours, which means I just have to pay for the fuel. Now, an important thing to consider is I do have to reserve my plane just like everyone else on the schedule. Just because I own the airplane doesn't mean that I have the opportunity to bump people off the schedule. 
I have to play by the same rules as everyone else, and in my opinion, that's a small price to pay for the fact that my airplane is costing me nothing to own. Okay, let's talk about the big, broad, general numbers of what it's like to own your own airplane on leaseback. Okay, as any ownership of an airplane, there are expenses, fixed and variable. You want to make sure that your airplane under a leaseback agreement is going to fly enough that hopefully all of your fixed costs will be covered from the revenue coming in from the leaseback agreement. Now, it doesn't necessarily need to cover all of your expenses to be considered a successful leaseback. That's your personal choice, your personal barometer. Maybe your leaseback only covers some of your ownership costs, and to you, that's just icing on the cake. And that's great. If, you're, if your goal was just to own an aircraft, you've done that, and maybe some of your costs are being offset. But if you heed these rules and these guidelines that I'm talking about today, you have a pretty good chance that it will cover your entire costs of ownership for your airplane. I'm going to make another video most likely where I break down some of my specific personal experience a little more in detail, but today we're just talking about in general how this has worked. My situation has been so great that not only has, have I been able to fly for free, essentially, and own an airplane for free, it's gone so well where I've been able to reinvest in my business and actually add more planes to my leaseback business. If it continues to work out the way it has, I'll just continue to build upon the business and let it grow as quickly as it can. But anyway, here's the bottom line. If you've been on the fence about how you can afford to buy an airplane, this is something to consider, leaseback agreements. Keep in mind, however, that if it doesn't pick up as you had hoped, you will have to cover all the expenses of ownership, of course, the fixed and the variable costs. Which is why, again, finding the right plane and the right place is extremely important for this whole strategy to work. Another thing, your plane will get wear and tear. I would suggest strongly, don't get too emotionally attached to the airplane. I know you like it. You think it's your baby. It is your baby. But the bottom line is, it will get a little more wear and tear than it would if it was only you flying it. And of course, that's to be expected. And finally, remember that a good, healthy relationship between you and your leaseback partner is paramount to any of this working. You're not their only concern. You're not their only customer. And it will serve you well to remember that at all times when things get bumpy. And inevitably, they will. Whether it's a maintenance concern, uh, renters that are treating your plane a little less well than you would have hoped, or it's a slow time in general and the revenue isn't coming in the way you've come to expect. Keep in mind that they're in this with you and you're in this with them. If you follow the guidelines and the general rules that I've talked about today, you do have a good chance of success. Why do I say that? Because it's worked for me. I can speak from personal experience. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, do me a favor, subscribe to my channel, hit that like button wherever it is, and look for more videos from me in the future. See you next time.